All right, let's get started, everybody. In our second talk tonight, we're going to get an update on the North Dakota State University research program on HASCAPs. And here to share with us the latest results is Kathy Wiederholt. Kathy is the Fruit Project Manager at the NDSU Carrington Research Extension Center. She's been, she's, she's the founder of the project. She was there from the beginning, 2006. And she conducts very interesting research in all kinds of fruit crops, testing them for use in gardens and for commercial purposes. She does work on apples and plums and pears and grapes, aronia, cherries, June berries, currants, and one of her favorite berries are hascaps. So Kathy, welcome to the forums. Thank you, Tom. Welcome. I really, I'm glad to be here again. So I have talked about hascaps before a few years ago, and I just kind of wanted to give everyone an update on what we're working on at the research center. Um, so we have all these kinds of fruit and you know, they've been around for a long time. Is there anything else you can learn new about them? Perhaps, but uh, I mean, it is good to have these woody crops for the long term and see how they do. Do they do they survive for 10, 15 years is, is kind of nice. So I have kind of turned my attention to Hascap. Um, we have not had great selections in the Northern Plains and we need some better ones. And so I've been looking at Hascaps along with Dr. Thompson from Oregon, uh, just trying to look at hers. And I'm gonna just get, give a general overview of the um, Hascaps for a little bit in case you haven't heard my talk before. And uh, if there's any more questions, of course we can talk about things at, at the end. <clears throat> So hascaps in general grow in the northern climates. They grow across, uh, well, they do grow across the United States, places like uh, Montana and Minnesota, Wisconsin, probably like North, um, Maine and New York State, probably too. Uh, in Canada, they're kind of on the eastern half of the of the country. I know they did not find them wild in um, British Columbia, but most provinces have it. So, so these are wild ones. Nobody has ever selected them or improved them or anything. Um, for that, we need to go to the other big continent um, for Russia and European, mainly in the Russian area. Uh, this is where the main hascaps that are sold uh, have come from in, the, in, in years past and years present. Um, the Russian plants grow more upright, and I'll show you some pictures of that. But uh, actually, what I really want to say is that in Russia, people have been using them for so long that they have made selections. So there's a lot of selections of better varieties, bigger fruit, tastier fruit. Uh, in Russia, they actually also select bitter fruit uh, because then you can put it with your vodka and use it in place of tonic water is what I've been told. So that's kind of funny. So you do sometimes find bitter bitterness in Russian in the Russian type fruit. Uh, all right, and then on the far right-hand side here, we have this long peninsula of Kamchatka, and there are little islands that once ran down to the northern island of Japan, that's Hokkaido Island. And the Kamchatka plants circled in green, those are, they grow kind of low and wide, um, and, and they're fuzzy, they're quite fuzzy. And then in Japan, the, those plants grow very upright. So I don't know how they ever got the different selection between there, but um, they, they do grow in kind of two opposite, opposite directions. So then in North America, uh, really the first person to do research was Dr. Thompson in Oregon. She's in the Corvallis area and she was interested in some kind of plants to do something to do in her retirement. And someone had given her a Hascap plant and it didn't do very well. And she wasn't impressed. But then someone gave her a Japanese Hascap plant and it did really well. The berries were wonderful. So she said, this is the ticket. And Dr. T Thompson had gone on somewhere between seven and nine different seed and cutting collection trips for USDA. And um, she also helped, she helped uh, found the 
the plant repository center that's out in in Oregon and there's several across the country now but uh, so, so she was very interested in collecting different plants and in 19 probably 99 or 2000 she made a deal to go to Japan and she collected seeds from eight different places a couple of growers and then a couple of research farms research research stations and she collected seeds and from those eight plants she has done all her breeding so it's very interesting to me all the all the characteristics you can pull out of these plants i mean there's small plants that have berries that are a quarter inch there are large plants that are like eight feet tall and they have huge berries like maybe two grams so it's very it's very interesting the things you can you know, tease out of the genetics of these of these plants. So, <clears throat> so she started her program in, in 2000. Then she talked to Dr. Bores in Saskatchewan, and she got him interested in in Hascaps, and they started breeding in 2004. Um, the Carrington Research Center, we just have trials, we don't do any breeding yet. Um, but we started that in well, we started in 2006, but the Hascap started in 2007, and I got Canadian plants and I got Japanese plants from Dr. Thompson. So we've been growing them ever since. And then I talked to uh, Zach Miller, and he's in charge of one of the research farms in Montana. Um, he's in the uh, Bitterroot Valley, uh, pretty much where that purple dot is uh, in Montana there, the Bitterroot Valley, the southern part of it. <clears throat> Uh, so he has trials there and there's like, I want to say six or seven places around the state that they have trials for different kinds of fruit plants. So, so that's it as far as any research goes. I do know that there is a lady who sells fruit, uh, sells hascaps or honeyberries from Arkansas, but Dr. Thompson was always under the impression that she couldn't actually breed any plants there that she just made selections of seedlings because it's so warm there and she sells the Russian kinds and the Russian kinds don't do well in warm climates. And um, I'll see if I, I might talk about that in a little bit here. So what is the name? Is it a honeyberry? Is it a hascap? Eh, you know, you can kind of, you can kind of use both terms. Um, the, the name honeyberry was uh, came from Jim Gilbert. He has One Green World Nursery in Oregon, and Jim travels the world finding different plants to grow. Uh, it's really a nice, uh, nice several day uh, effort, maybe or whatever, to a uh, pleasure perhaps to look at their catalog or or their website and see all the things that we cannot grow in North Dakota, uh, but they can grow well out there. But it's it's just very interesting. So. The plants he brought over were Russian. So in general, uh, people who work with these plants kind of say that honeyberry re refers to the Russian types, but honeyberry is a very attractive name. So it's used for a lot of other, it's used for almost anything. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, hascaps. Hascaps are used when, the name hascap is used when the plants come from Japan. Uh, the, the, the name hascap is very similar to what the Anu people would have called it, like Haskapa, Huskapa, something. I, I'm not exactly sure. There's a lot of uh, different spellings and phonetic uh, variations on it. But uh, hascap is generally re referred to uh, or used when we refer to the Japanese plants. So I have read a long time ago that actually there's an overarching term you can use for any plant or and it, or any any fruit and it's called edible blue honeysuckle because these are honeysuckle plants and they are edible and they're blue so edible blue honeysuckle kind of would cover all your bases for this <clears throat> so this is just a quick look at the fruit and the plants that we have um, the russian the picture on the right hand upper upper side is a russian plant and then below that is actually one of the kamchatka plants and one thing to note on that kamchatka is it doesn't grow very upright they grow kind of wide they're, they're i said they're fuzzy they have large leaves um, and the fruit is really hidden inside there. So the Canadian plants that were developed in 2007, they actually are a cross between a small Russian plant, so sort of an upright plant, a small Russian plant, and this low, wide Kamchatka variety. Um, 
so they don't really have much of a chance of being a tall, easy to harvest plant. I call them gumdrops because they kind of grow in uh, kind of like a gumdrop, kind of a rounded mound. So yeah, after about five years, you can finally get the branches lifted off the ground. I prune them every year to try to get the lower branches off and everything going upward and outward, upward and outward. And still, it, it, it took about five years before I could finally get them lifted off the ground. And they've kind of stayed that way, which is nice, but it, it's, it's a pain. <clears throat> so then, and then we have the Japanese variety, right? The, so the three kinds. And in the pictures of the fruit, we have Russian ones on the left. They're long and skinny. Uh, you know, they're all, they're, they can, all these berries can be different shapes. But uh, in general, I would say the Russian berries are kind of long ovals. And then on the right-hand side in the center there is a picture of some of the Japanese fruit. It is also kind of oval, teardrop shaped, could be heart shaped, like a cowbell. Um, but they're they're blocky and uh, more oval than, or mm, a blocky oval, I guess. They're definitely bigger. Uh, but they, again, they come in all sizes. They come in all shapes, every, every single kind. So it is, it's pretty amazing. This is a picture of Dr. Thompson's orchard. And uh, so these plants, these plants, uh, she did not keep plants very long. Um, the plants you see here are probably, um, I would say three to four years old. And then on the kind of in the middle on the left hand side, you can see some really small plants. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'm pointing at the small plants. So what happens is she would put plants in for several years and they should have fruit in their third year. And if they had small fruit or very little amount of fruit, you know, they were evaluated and then they probably were evaluated one more year into their fourth year. And if they just aren't doing well, out they go. They just, uh, they get lifted out, thrown in the trash heap, and then new plants from all the new breeding go in. So it's a continuous cycle of re re renewing your breeder books and your plant books and your pot plot books. And um, <clears throat> it's a way to get a lot of uh, research done. Her plants were planted every two feet apart because she wasn't planning on keeping the plants for very long. They weren't going to, going to be allowed to get very big. So <clears throat> um, I should say I started going there in 2012 and I've been there almost every year since 2012 to try to collect new plant material. At first I was just helping her and learning and then I started uh, making choices. So at first she gave me plants that she selected and then later when I was able to go and actually harvest the fruit, then I could see how the fruit clung to the to the plants, and then I could make selections on which ones clung better. Because here in this picture, this is the reason we're still looking for the perfect plant. Um, Hascaps in general bloom for about 10 to 14 days, Hascaps and honeyberries. They just bloom over a long period and then they ripen over that two week period. So at the same time, you've got less ripe and more ripe fruit on the plant and the more ripe fruit tends to fall. Um, doesn't happen for every variety, but it happens for a lot. Uh, it seems, well, I don't have that much experience with all the Russian varieties. There's a lot of Russian varieties out there, but the ones we do have, two out of the three actually hold their fruit quite well, but actually it's so well, they hold it so well that it's almost hard to pick. Um, and, and the one that uh, doesn't hold well, that one falls off pretty easily. But uh, so this is, this is what we see in North Dakota. Of course, you are guaranteed to get some kind of a wind or a rainstorm, thunderstorm. Uh, this actually happened to be a thunderstorm. There's actually water on the leaves of this plant and you know, those gusty winds. So these berries were within like one to two days of being ready to harvest. We we're just waiting for a little bit more sweetness, you know, and um, they fell. I came in the morning and they were all on the ground. It's very disappointing. And it's very hard to collect data this way. Actually, um, in the, on the next slide, we will have um, a table of, of uh, harvest weights, but some of those harvest weights are affected by the berries that fell. You cannot pick these all up and in a, in a production setting, you would never pick them off the ground. So uh, yeah, that, that's our big problem, what we're trying to overcome by looking at these different varieties. All right, here is this uh, table I promised you. And what I have done, I, I call it normalizing. I know that's not the right statistical word, but I kind of normalize this. Um, 
because we got all these planets in different years. So I look back through the data and then I have them aligned by the year they started producing fruit. And then I have the harvest records for all of that. So this is pounds of fruit per plant. Um, you know, I know that in other places in the country that people can get a lot more production than this. In Oregon, you would get a lot more production. But um, our biggest concern is that when we tested the, or whatever, when we've grown the Canadian plants, which are the, the group in yellow, which is Borealis, Tundra, Indigo Gem, and Indigo Treat, we have seen very poor production in these plants. And they're large plants. Um, and I, I know we did this Haskat buy back in 10, 2010, 11, 12, somewhere in there. Uh, a, a member of the grape growers bought like thousand, about a thousand plants each year of those three years. And they were dispersed across the state in Montana. And I tried talking to people in like 2012 or 13 and asking them, how is your plant doing? Would you consider it produces enough to be for commercial production? And the answer was no, uh, like eight, I think it was like 10 people out of 12 or actually had 25 respondents. So what would it be? It would be like 22 people, 22 people out of 25 all said no, they didn't think it'd be okay for commercial production because they weren't getting good production either. So I don't know why it's possible that the pollinizing variety is not the correct variety. Um, we always, the first two, the first two plants on here in green are two Russian varieties, berry blue and bluebell. Those are always advertised as the pollinizing variety for the Russian, or excuse me, for the Japanese, no, excuse me again. The top two Russians are advertised as pollinizers for the four Canadians just below it. And so they should do well. I mean, they're recommended by the university in Saskatchewan. So we have them and we should be getting fruit, but we don't, uh, or not very much. I will say that Indigo Jam has been our best producer. And that's because Indigo Jam is partly self, uh, self-pollinizing because um, you need two varieties, you know, just like apples, you need two varieties. So uh, two different varieties. And so indigo jam can produce a crop by itself, but it should produce a better crop when it is um, mixed up with some other plants that pollinize it well. So, so uh, we have been I have been gravitating to the Japanese varieties. Um, the third group is in blue here, uh, 2008 Japanese Haskap, and we have just gotten more berries from them. And I ha and again. Um, a lot of berries have fallen. So this is the best harvest number I can get, but we have lost a lot of berries over the years from these plants. <clears throat> um, the the, one of the lower groups here, the 2012 Japanese plants is kind of a, a peachy color. So those we've had the most fruit from it's, it's, they've done pretty well. I broke them up into three groups. They're actually some different amounts of plants in there, but I just broke them up. Um, so we've had more, more fruit there. And then I do want to draw your attention to the very last line, which is a darker pink. Uh, these are plants that I selected in 2017. And these were very high in production. The, this is the year three planting, which is their very first year of production. And not all of the plants, but some of the plants gave us 2.2 to 3.3 pounds of fruit per plant. There were two plants that gave 3.3 uh, pounds. And I think there were three different plants that gave us two pounds of fruit per plant. So, you know, hopefully in the year four and five, then we'll really see how they do. Is it, you know, a fluke or, or what? Um, but I think, I think that we'll be getting some better numbers here now. So, and now I want to, I should have, I don't know where I was going to put this. Um, people ask like, where can they buy these plants? And your handout that I have for you is actually a list of, of places that you can buy Haskaps. You know, I can't say like we recommend them, but they're places I know of and places I have bought plants from. So you'll just have to read about them and or ask me questions and I can help you and uh, decide which plants are, are for you. So on the bottom here are the four name varieties from Dr. Thompson that are on the market. 
and there is um, Solo and Kiko. Those are available through Proven Winners. And the company who developed them, they actually call them Yesberries. Oh, and you know what? I forgot. There's like Sugar Mountain Blue, isn't there? And one more. I forgot those. But it's a proven, there's there's four proven winners and they call them Yesberries, Y-E-Z, Yesberries. Um, they found the berries referred to that somewhere. Uh, so those are from them. And so those should be at your local greenhouses, um, big box stores, just depends on if they buy those plants from, from the retailer or the, the wholesaler. And then the last two are Opus and Kauai. And those are the last plants that Dr. Thompson uh, put out there. And Opus is the plant that she considers to be her very best. It is so productive. It's so sweet and tasty, but the plant is a little soft. Like it, it is very fine stems and it will droop down in the, um, uh, under the weight of the fruit. And one that goes with it is Kauai and also a very, very productive plant uh, named after one of her very good friends. So, so those are the Japanese ones that I know about. And then this is part of our research here. Uh, this was this picture is the, the, the 2017 plants that uh, produced for the first time in 2020. And uh, this is their third season. And this is some of the plants where those, those weights were taken from, where there was 2.2 and 3.3 pounds per plant. Some of those were in this row. So we have, to, we and you, if you want to get a crop on your on your hascaps, you will need to net your, your plants because these are the first fruits available and the birds go nuts over them. They, they're so attracted to them. Um, they will land on the net and everything. We, we try to keep the net off of the plants because um, yeah, the birds will pick right through it. They're, they're just crazy for it. And what else can I tell you? Um, oh, the number of plants. So between 2007 and 2012, uh, the number of selections, and we have about three plants per selection. So we had 19 uh, selections. And then from 2007 or 2017 to 19, we had 47 more selections added to the program. And then um, this last number, 25, that's the number of plants I have coming and uh, I'll be planting them this year. Um, hopefully this year or next spring. So um, a lot of plants, there's like 91 different selections and we plant two to three plants for each one just to make sure nothing happens to them and that we can have that available for us. So I want I put these pictures up as a, a possibility of what we could have as a possibility. On the left actually is Opus and on the right is Kauai. And these are, I mean, look at the amount of fruit on these plants. It's really amazing. And uh, the best thing you can do is keep pruning your plants and keep getting new growth. Uh, these hascaps produce the most fruit on the one year wood. Um, you know, you'll have the wood that grew last year. And then when the, the buds start to come out and the flower, the flowers are on those buds that are coming and uh, on those little shoots. And so, uh, yeah, it, it, there's whatever, I don't know what I'm going to say. I'm just amazed at how much fruit is on these plants. And I'm hoping that we can see that here in Carrington. So uh, my summary is that uh, hascaps, a delicious and hearty fruit, uh, grows well in pretty much any soil. Uh, don't have to have an acid soil or anything like that. And um, I can tell you that in Saskatchewan at the research farm that their soil is clay and they, they get a good crop of hascaps up there. So it's probably fine. Um, winemakers really want the fruit. The problem is we just don't have great varieties for doing this like um, commercial harvesting, even uh, just even a large scale harvesting. I'm really concerned about how well the fruit can hang on the plant. So even though some people would love to plant it and get going and grow more fruit, I tell them to be cautious because uh, you don't want your whole crop ruined the night before you're ready to pick it. So such a pain. So so yeah, it's hard to buy plants in the US. You know, the Canadian plants are propagated in Canada. And so we just get them from wholesalers here in the US. There's no propagators here. So they end up being a little more expensive and they're the only really great ones. Um, Dr. Thompson's Japanese plants are now more available. Uh, there's a British Columbia propagator, but again, that's Canada, but he does have a US arm. 
And then uh, you'll have to look on your handouts. We also have uh, Proven Winners and the uh, Gardens Alive. Gardens Alive runs like themselves and Gurneys and is it called Spring Meadow or something like that? I don't think that's the right name, but they, they do several different things. And um, so they're, they're in charge of Opus and Kauai. So there's like, I think there are six for sure available. And then there's a place called Haskap, Oregon, and they sell about six of Dr. Thompson's selections also. So so there they are. And oh, you know, and I just found this out that the University of Idaho did work with Haskaps a long time ago. They got seeds from Dr. Thompson and they've made some selections and there is a grower up there. You're going to have to ask me if you want them. I'm not sure if I should recommend them. They say that the plants, the fruit ripens in like the third week of July. And if that's true, it's going to be way too late for fruit flies. You know, the SWD, the spotted wing Drosophila fruit fly, just uh, it, it can, it'll definitely get into them if it can, if they're, if they're a very late fruit. So I would like to grow those first before I recommend them to you. So, all right, where are we? Um, current cultivars eh, for North Dakota. Worth a try, though. Definitely worth a try in your yard. It's not going to be as windy in your yard as it is, you know, out in the field. So, I would definitely try them if you have the opportunity. So in, in, in the end here, the Japanese cultivars have been the most productive and those are the ones we're focusing on. We're looking for plants that don't drop their fruit. And we are in general, just growing new material from, from Dr. Thompson's breeding program. So um, I hope I have a little time here. I just wanna, I just have two slides for Promise Tom. <laughs> Maybe it's three, but I so planted those in spring. And then, um, so they grew that whole spring. They grew, I let them grow from spring of 2008 to spring of 2009. And then I cut them back to only about uh, two to three inches tall. And then that in 2009, they, they grew and became woody. And uh, we'll see this in the next picture too. They grew and became woody. And then in 2010, they uh, look like this and they're, having, they're gonna have fruit. So they definitely, they want to grow and cutting something back like this is very good for the plants. So in, here's this other example. Um, these were planted in, in the fall. You can definitely plant Hascaps in the fall. I have planted as late as like the 15th of October, you know, I just got so busy and never got them planted. I think these are actually, this is the 6th of October. So they're all planted and they grew. And the next spring, I just let them do whatever they were going to do. I just, because I didn't know how well the roots had settled. Um, so they grew for a whole year. And then in 20, let me see. So they grew in 2013. And then in the spring of 2014, I cut them back, just like I said, two to three inches, um, every single every single bud or branch that was above the ground. And then uh, they grew in 2014. And this is how they look in the spring of 2015 on the right hand side. That's about um, two feet tall or so, and it's ready to go. It's, those are nice, sturdy canes on there. Um, anything that was low or small, was probably pruned off and uh, just left these nice these nice um, canes that were ready to go and fruit. So <clears throat> so don't be afraid to prune your plants. You know the energy for a plant is of a woody plant is mainly in its roots and it's stored there over the winter. And in the spring, if you cut off that old growth, all it has to do it has to put its energy somewhere and it's going to just uh, put its energy into buds that are there and buds that are hiding and it's going to push up a whole bunch of new growth and uh, you know and if a plant is weak this is another way to strengthen it is you cut it back and then the energy again is just going to go into these new shoots and they will hopefully be strong and healthy so and this i just wanted to this is my last this one is my last slide tom um i uh i just wanted to show on the very left hand side you can see these crazy shrubs they kind of look like albert einstein's hair they're just big and brown and and fuzzy and so that's how these shrubs looked and then i thought so how should i cut them back i want to regrow these shrubs they're so thick what should i do i took several shrubs here in the middle right by this post just on the uh, this side of the post, there's several shrubs that look really small and 
terrible. Well, I cut those all the way to the ground, basically. I just left about four inches about above the ground. And I thought, I don't know, we'll just see what happens. I don't really want these shrubs anymore. And they did grow back, but they took some time. They took some time. And right in front of us here on the right-hand side, these shrubs I cut back, and you can mainly see it in the center there. I cut them back maybe to about a foot or a foot and a half. I took off all the outer stuff and I left these um, stronger, sturdier branches, uh, like scaffold branches, main branches. And I left those. And so I left no little finger branches on them. They, they look like sticks. And they have a lot of buds under that bark somewhere and they produced all these new canes. So I think this is the best way to do like a big rejuvenation pruning. Uh, Cause if you're a grower, you can't do, you can't prune individual plants every year. It's, it's a lot of work. Um, so I think what the thing to do is, is to do a big rejuvenation, like maybe every three years or so, every four years. And, <clears throat> and you could do one row and not the other row. Um, you know, just kind of keep it moving along and then you could stagger it and then uh, always have plants that are at the peak of their production. So, all right, this, this, is, this is the end. Here's some beautiful Haskep flowers and uh, I'm ready for questions. The, pl the plants are just starting to turn green now. So we'll be having blossoms in a while. Okay, Kathy, thank you. And we're gonna go through these questions rapidly. Okay. Okay, uh, you mentioned a lot about pruning. Is there a best time of the year to do it? The best time to prune is still now. Uh, when the danger of really cold weather, when you're when you're below when you're past the below zero weather, <clears throat> and before the plants start to bud, is your best time to prune. Is there a guide that you recommend, like maybe from Saskatchewan or someplace, about how to grow has caps? Well, I actually, I would check out the University, University of Saskatchewan's website. They probably have the most information. So. You, we saw a lot of fruits drop on the ground. Um, I don't know if you or Jim Gilbert's ever been to Italy where they, they say they put, uh, uh, one of our questions, they put uh, nets under, underneath the olive trees to ah. collect the, the fallen <laughs> fruits. Have you ever thought about doing that? Well, <laughs> That would require a lot of help, I think, in my situation. And so, no. But it's I did, worth it. <laughs> I did try putting like some landscape cloth under them once to collect them. But, you know, there is that thing about collecting fruit off the ground. It's possible that a mouse once ran on that ground and maybe he pooped. Yeah. And you're not supposed to collect fruit off the ground. So, yeah, the uh, net suspended in the air might be great. Okay, there you go. That's your next project. Okay, you bring your back with you when you uh, come. Okay, <laughs> I'll do a couple plants for you. <laughs> How about, uh, do you irrigate your trials? You know, this last year was the first year I've ever irrigated. So I, I think we'll be seeing some better production with the irrigation. Um, yeah, it, we, we, we don't have water at the orchard, but I have a giant 1200 gallon tank and I've spent a couple of years running around with header hoses and I, I think we've got it under control now. So we're gonna start irrigating. How about, uh, do you recommend mulching your has caps? I totally recommend mulching any woody plants. Yes, it'll keep the soil cool, the roots cool. It'll keep moisture in the ground and keep that pesky grass away. Grass is so competitive with woody plants. So definitely mulch. Where do you buy your netting? I buy my netting. Uh, I buy I, I buy it by the bale. It's like thirteen hundred feet, and I get it from, um, what is it called? Well, MDT and Associates in the cities, but it's a whole bale. So, um, okay, just buy yeah, some with your friends. Maybe check with me if you're in the area. Okay, and you mentioned about the spotted wing drosophila. Is that a problem with has caps or or not? It's a problem with later hascaps. We are selecting um, Maxine Thompson's friend and I, Shinji Kawai. Uh, he and I, we've ch decided to choose the earliest hascaps, the, the ones that ripen the earliest, because the fruit flies do get in the later ones. So, yeah. Lots of pruning questions. Can you can you prune mm -hmm. even when it's really dry, like it is out here in the West? Well, I. I'll say yes. Uh, yeah, the, why not? the less the less plant that the roots have to support, the better, I would say. 
but you should, if you didn't water last fall, you should really consider watering this spring. Just some kind of drip irrigation and, and mulch, mulch to keep that moisture in. And you prune them hard. I would prune them pretty hard. If you, you know, in general, I remove kind of like apple pruning. I remove things that point inward. I remove things that grow downward. And uh, if there's just too much, if it's just too congested, you can just take out something and take out the weak stuff, but also think about taking out, once the plant is four or five years old, start removing one or two of the older, heavier canes because that's gonna open the plant up and encourage new growth. And these fruit on newer growth, new vigorous growth. So um, definitely prune them every, you know, after they're about three or four years old, definitely start removing old stuff. Okay, when you eat a has cap, do you have to spit out the seeds or do you just eat the whole thing? No, you just eat the whole thing. They're in like a little jelly sack and um, they're like the size of sesame seeds, but flatter, smaller and flatter. And I have never, I've, I think I've almost never felt a seed when I've eaten them. Yeah, just kind of like blueberries, right? Isn't that like the blueberry blueberries for the like prairie kind of? Yeah, they have like a sandy seed, a really small round seed. But like I said, these are in a little they're like a tomato seed where they have that little pulp, that little viscous sack mm -hmm. over them or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. it's got flesh around it. So they're, they're very slippery in your mouth. You won't, you won't know you have them there. Okay. What do you do with the has cap? Anyhow, do you just mix it for vodka or yeah. wine or. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Them for I, ice we, cream or something. We did make liqueur out of them by steeping the berries in vodka, but uh, wine. Uh, we freeze them once. Once any any fruit is frozen, you can use it. Uh, yeah, in your yogurt, you could make a crisp with it or something. Um, what else do I do with it? You could put it in muffins. Any anything like that. Uh, most I really like them in my yogurt. Are, do they get invasive? Jam. Like when their seeds drop. You know, we do not see much of that. We once in a while, we see a few seedlings start under the plants, but we have the wood chips, which really helps. They Perhaps they need light to germinate. I'm not sure. But um, I was kind of concerned in the past. I've seen, I've seen honeysuckle plants growing, but I think over all this time, I've determined that they're not these honeysuckles. They are the Tatarian honeysuckles that are growing in the trees. Uh, we have, you know, the wild shrubby things growing there. Mm. So I, mm. I, I, don't, I do not think they're invasive. Okay, here's a question. Do the fruits have thrones on the branches? I don't know what that I means. I bet they mean thorns. Thorns. No thorns. Right. No thorns. Good. Kind of once the bark gets old, it gets kind of peeling. It's kind of interesting. Okay. Now this person's has caps is already starting to bloom. Mm. Now, now we're getting freezing weather now. Is that going to be a problem? Are we going to lose our crop? They say that has cap flowers can take 19 degrees Fahrenheit and still produce fruit. We have had some time, we had one year when we had 17 and 18 degrees while it was blooming, the Russian ones were blooming. Um, and I don't know if they actually, if those flowers actually produced fruit, I'm not sure. I will tell you that the bloom period was very long because I think that the blossoms that were on their way were set back and, and delayed. And then they kind of regrouped and then started blooming again. We had, a, we had a crop that year. So uh, I can't exactly tell you, but I think they will be all right. Okay, birds like cash caps. How mm -hmm. about deer? You know, I know that when fields of hascaps are planted, the deer will pull the plants out of the ground. I, I don't know if they will eat the plants in general because deer always want to taste something new, you know, that's how they learn. Um, but I don't know if they like them uh, in general because we have a fence around there and the deer can't get to them. They're kind of a fuzzy leaf, so they, may, mm. they might not like that fuzzy leaf. Yeah. Okay, again, the, the ASCAPs out here in the West are breaking their buds. Can you still prune them? If they're not broken very much, you know, you can, you can prune anything at any time. But um, I will tell you, once, once it's broken the buds, the energy has already been put into that shoot. And so you've wasted some of the energy from the roots. So I would say you probably can still prune and uh, your plant will be fine. I mean, they're tough. They're tough. Can ideal you, is before they break bud 
Right. How about, uh, do you have to have two varieties to get fruit? In general, you have to have two. The variety Solo and that variety Indigo Jam are partly self-fruitful, but um, or self-pollinating, but in general, you will get a much better crop with two varieties, and they have to be two unrelated varieties, like Borealis and Tundra can't pollinate each other. So whoever you buy the plants from should be selling you the correct pollinizing variety. It's got to be an unrelated variety. Okay. Are all the Japanese, you like Japanese selections, are all of them late ripening? How yeah, many, how about the, that spotted wing drosophila? Do you, how long do you have to spray for that? Yeah, hopefully only once or twice with Hascaps. Um, okay. In general, the Russian ones ripen around July 15th to July, or excuse me, June 15th to June 30th is what we found. And then the Canadian ones are right around the 4th of July. And then the Japanese ones are somewhere between the 1st or 4th of July until about the 10th of July. And we're trying to push that back a little and get the earliest ripening ones. And we do see a good SWD infestation by July 10th, usually every year. And you can dehydrate them, can't you, the berries? You can. When I have done it, they're quite crispy, but you know, for other kinds of fruit like um, um, currants or cranberries, they soak them in a 30% sugar solution and then you dry them and then they'll stay uh, like a, they'll stay like grapes. They'll stay like raisins because raisins are like 25, 30% sugar when they get dehydrated. Yeah, I think we could just have the Hascap hour here. Yeah. Uh, the question just keep coming in here. Um, are you going to have a field day this year, Kathy? I would say we are. People are tired of not having stuff. So we, we will, I'm, I'm sure we'll have a field day and it'll be July 20th. I do know that date already, July 20th. Okay, we'll put that on our calendar. It's kind of late for Hascaps though. And anybody can come out and visit you anytime as long as they bring a pruners, right? That's right. <laughs> there you go. I got some more wisdom here. Uh, forget the netting, use swimming pools, kids swimming pools underneath the bush. I yes. think, does Bob Boris do that? I think, did I hear he, yes, the guy they from tried Saskatchewan it. do that? It. Yeah, kind of cut it in two and then put the two halves together. That It works. It, I, we haven't done that. I use a cloth. We just take old bed sheets and put them underneath there and just pick them like that. Okay, as Kathy, if somebody wants your PowerPoint, you, they just have to email you. Yes. And, yeah, there you go. I am going to, you know what? Oh, we're just going to take a few more here. Uh, what do you do if the, the bunnies ate the, the two-year-old honeyberries to the ground? Just well, I know what I would do. But... Kill the bunnies. <laughs> you just, I, you're going to have to put a cage around them or something, I guess. Uh, yeah, plants, will, you know. plants will recover though, right? Yeah. It's just like oh, pruning. Yeah. They'll actually probably grow better once they eat them, yeah. ate them down. They did a favor this for this, you. This is this pruning to three to four inches. How about the branches that you cut off? Can you propagate them? Well, it's probably you can illegal. propagate from dormant cuttings, but um, and you can propagate from green cuttings in June. But um, I'm not sure. Uh, well, I guess you're, you're asking about pr things you pruned off. It has to be one year old wood, not the old wood. It has to be the red colored one year old wood. That's what you propagate. And it needs to be as big as possible. But let me say, all plant breeders need money, right? They, there's hardly any grant funding or anything for plant breeders. And the only way they can get money is for you to buy a plant that has a 50 cent, or if you're lucky, a $1, but generally it's 25 to 50 cent royalty from a plant you buy. For, if you buy a plant for $20 and there's a 50 cent royalty on there, it's the 50 cents that goes back to the breeder. And so they can, they can keep working on these crops. So I encourage you to not, to, to actually buy the plants if you, if you can. Yeah. It's, it's patented. Are those are, those are patents. All the, they? all the Hascap varieties are patented. Yeah. So in some we're way, talking about yeah. the law here, the Hascap police will get you. Yeah. It's not I mean, worth it, it. It is illegal to, to propagate any patented plant, even for yourself. But right. I believe it is on the breeder to actually be the person to go and find wow. you and find you. So it's, you know, it's not going to happen, but yeah. Morally, morally, we should morally. do the right thing. It's got to be on the honor system honor as gardeners. System, yeah. Okay, last question. Then I'm, 
how close when you plant like a, a two two varieties, how close they have to be to pollinate each other? Is it? I think it's like thirty feet. Okay, sounds so, good, Kathy. Yeah. I want to thank you. You just you just got everybody so jazzed up tonight. <laughs> And they're so it, delicious i just said yeah they, yeah they are super and um listen for i'm sorry we just can't get to all the questions i try to get as many as we can i think we've answered like over over 30 35 40. um please contact kathy if you have any sp uh, special questions she is the expert of north dakota for has caps and she's a wealth of knowledge just contact her directly and she'll be very helpful Okay. If you bring your pruners, yeah. And bring your bring your <laughs> bring your back and your pruners. Get the work out. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Kathy. A okay. Lot. Thank you, Tom. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Have a good spring. Mm -hmm.